Acts chapter 19, verse number 1. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And let's go to that now. And it happened while Apollos was in Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Now, Paul, he was a church planning machine. His life's work was to travel from places or to places where people didn't know or follow Jesus, and he did everything in his power to change that. And he had his sights set on Ephesus, and he wanted to see a major spiritual breakthrough in this city. Everybody say breakthrough. And while it would definitely happen, it wouldn't happen overnight. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years. Spiritual breakthroughs are always powerful. And they're always possible. But they're not always prompt. They're always incredible, but they're rarely instant. Today, I want to talk to you on the subject, the process of breakthrough. Let's pray together. God, you've been here with us already today in a powerful way. I'm asking you, God, to anoint me to speak your word. This is your word today and to deliver it to your people. I'm asking you, God, that your people would have an anointing on them to receive this word. And, God, that you would help us to understand the process of breakthrough and experience it in our own lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Can you imagine what life would be like without one of these? The light bulb. It's one of the most taken for granted inventions or objects in the 21st century. But seriously, think about what your life would be like if we did not simply have a light bulb. Right now, you would be sitting in the dark. <laughs> You would be coming into worship tonight with your lantern or today in your lantern and you're just coming to praise God and you got yourself a candle or something. Or we'd have torches on the wall for worship. It's that wonderful time of the year where it gets dark around 5 p.m. So if you, for some reason, didn't get home by then, you would be driving down Chippingham at about 60 miles an hour with candles fixed to the front of your car. <laughs> praying that you didn't go so fast that it blew your candle out and you drove right off the road. It reminds me, years ago, I was driving down a country road and it was dark and there was no lights around. And in, in the car in front of me, I look up and I see this, these little hands lifting up and it was holding a book in the back window of their car. And it was you, they were using my headlights to read. <laughs> so I did what any normal person would do, and I turned off my headlights. <laughs> I'm a good person. And, and I waited a little while, and I'm like, you know, this is fun. I waited a little while, and I turn them back on, and then I see slowly that book starts to raise up again. <laughs> and they're like, you know, this is before cell phones, y'all. This is they, the Kids didn't have cell phones. They didn't have games and stuff on your phone at this time, okay? So I'm like, you know, this is too much fun. So I, they raise it on up again, and I did the right thing because I got to stick with doing the right thing, and I turn them back off again course I turn it back on and I waited a little while and I was really excited to see that this child was quite tenacious and for the third time it raised the book into the light and I decided it was time to let the poor child read <laughs> but that's what the importance of light bulbs you know we're in we're approaching the Christmas season you guys know oh, this is mind-blowing do you know that before light bulbs they used to put candles 
in Christmas trees? Candles. What, what a better idea than to get an old dried up pine tree, put it in your house, and put fire sticks all over them. <laughs> Wonder how my house burnt down every Christmas. Man. The list goes on and on and on about the importance of the light bulb. Well, our lives would be very different if it wasn't for Thomas Edison. This guy here, man, he, we think about it as a breakthrough in modern technology. It's, it, but this breakthrough was not instantaneous. It didn't happen overnight. See, this is a picture of a replica of the laboratory where he... Thomas Edison conducted over 3,000 experiments over a two-year period. And again, I want you to think about it. This breakthrough was two years and 3,000 experiments in the making. Edison had, had to go through thousands of hours of getting it wrong before he finally got it right. The light bulb was an incredible breakthrough, but it wasn't immediate. It didn't happen in a split second. So we tend to think of all breakthroughs, whether they're scientific or they are spiritual, as things that happen in an instant. We might, it, it, it might look immediate, but usually there's a backstory behind every breakthrough that produces real and lasting change. And that backstory usually involves things like patience and process and planning. And we find out that there are some very strategic steps that have to be applied consistently across time that finally lead to a miraculous moment. Thomas Edison didn't arrive at this big scientific breakthrough without process. And many times the same is true in the spiritual sense. Today, I want to describe to you the steps that can position you for spiritual breakthrough. Now, the ladies, they just got a spiritual breakthrough. They had a, they had a whole uh, couple days called breakthrough. And so they're kind of, you know, set up for this. But I want to talk to us today about the process that goes into it and the process that follows. Let's revisit our text and get a little backstory about what's going on here Some amazing things are going to happen in Ephesus, but they definitely didn't happen in an instant. This is the location here of the ancient city of Ephesus. This is right in modern-day Turkey. When Paul arrives there in Acts 19, he's on his third missionary journey, his third tour of the ancient world. And the main objective that he had in mind when he started this trip was Ephesus. He had his sight set on this location for several reasons. First, because it was a very big city. It was the third, maybe the fourth largest city in the ancient Roman world. And it was an influential city. It was a hub for trade and for travel. And from, from people from all over the world would make their way to and from Ephesus. Paul knew that if he could just get a hold of these people in Ephesus and get a church established there and the people that would come there, they would experience this and they would take it back home with them wherever they lived. So he had been trying to get a church in Ephesus for years, but after a series of delays and setbacks, he finally arrives. And what he believes is going to happen is nothing less than a powerful, dynamic, spiritual breakthrough. I want to stop here for just a moment, and I want to ask you this. Is there anybody here this morning that's hoping or even needing a powerful, dynamic, spiritual breakthrough in your life? Is there anybody that desperately wants some spiritual movement to take place? Maybe you're feeling stuck. Maybe there was a time in your past where you were moving forward and you were growing in your faith and you felt like you were becoming more like Jesus, but... That was some time ago. And you feel maybe like you're a little stalled out right now and the spiritual fire may have dwindled to the point that it feels like it's just burning ashes. And if that's you, you need a breakthrough. Maybe you remember a time when you were in life where you were excited about God and you couldn't wait to get into the prayer room in the morning and and God was clearly speaking to you when you read his word and you were actively looking for opportunities to share your faith. But today it seems like all that may have happened to another person and surely it wasn't you because you feel far from God and remembering the good old days only makes you feel farther. If you do, feel that way. 
then you need a breakthrough. When we hear these words, you you need a breakthrough. Many of us, we automatically assume or kind of feel like that translates in our minds to, I need some sort of immediate spiritual experience that's going to shake me out of the place that I've fallen into. Thank God for the times where it happens that way. We, we can come in struggling, but after worship and after the word, when some time at the altar, we can feel completely changed. And there's, a, there's definitely breakthrough moments where God shifts everything in an instant, and I'm grateful for that. There are times where God, where only the anointing of God and the presence of God can break the yoke off of us and, the, and we can experience something that happens in a moment and we're, I'm happy that those kinds of things happen. But real, lasting, meaningful breakthroughs rarely happen in an instant. Sometimes in addition to spiritual experiences, we need a spiritual plan in order to experience a spiritual breakthrough. Like Thomas Edison, sometimes the breakthroughs that we are after, they require something from us. Getting the light bulb to to work or getting that invention to finally come to fruition, it took effort, it took investment, it took commitment, it took strategy, it took perseverance. And those words aren't usually something we associate with a spiritual breakthrough. We normally just associate spiritual breakthrough with just surrender and faith, not the other parts of this thing. But I think they play a bigger role in lasting, meaningful change than any of us realize. All of those words certainly certainly played a role in the breakthrough that eventually took place in Ephesus. When we study what things Paul did prior to getting big results, I think there are two takeaways that we can apply to our pursuit of spiritual breakthroughs in our own personal lives. We can see two things that need to be in place to see real, deep, meaningful, and lasting differences in our relationship with God. And if you really want to move forward with Him, you need both. I'm going to give you number one right now, and I hope some of you might be taking some notes. Number one, have a plan. Everybody say, have a plan. If you want To get spiritually unstuck, you're going to have have to have a plan. Paul showed up in Ephesus with more than just a hope and maybe maybe good things are going to happen. Just, hey, I'm here, just hoping, hoping things work out for me. He didn't just go sit down in the middle of the city and wait for some miraculous thing to just show up and and explode and happen in the middle of the city. See, the miracle signs and wonders fall I mean, all of those amazing emotional moments that we have they, that, that give us goosebumps, the Bible says all of those things followed the apostles. So as the apostles moved, as they began to work, as they began to follow their plan, the miracles, the signs and wonders, they followed them. But oftentimes we're waiting for the miracle signs and wonders to change us before we move. But the apostles learned that if they followed the plan of God, if they walked in his righteousness and walked in his way, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the blessings, the things that God promised us, they followed them as they followed the plan of God. Those were confirmations, those miracle signs and wonders and goosebumps. They always took place after the apostles took action, not before. The Bible says that, here's in Acts 19 and 18, and when he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. For anyone that might not know, synagogue for the Jews at Ephesus has a lot in common with what we have as church today. It was a gathering place where they would read scripture together and they would worship together and they would listen to teachings from the rabbis. And Paul's plan was to go into this Jewish house of worship and talk about Jesus. So it it wasn't the first time he had done this. this. This was what he did when he came into a city that he was trying to establish a church into. So let's look at Acts 17, 1 through 2. He tells, Luke tells us a few chapters earlier that they came to Thessalonica, another Greek city, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, 
went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. This was Paul's custom. Let me stop for a second. I'm teaching here some this morning, okay? And we're going to get a little bit of preaching maybe a little bit later on in the message, but I'm teaching some. We've got to learn a little something from scripture here. Paul's custom. This is what he did. Luke records that at least seven times when Paul went into a city, went to the synagogue, and started trying to convert people to Christianity. He had a routine. He had a custom. He had a plan that he was following. It was his strategy. And all he's doing in Ephesus is working his plan. He wasn't winging it. He wasn't making it up as he goes. He wasn't just hoping that somehow it's just going to happen. He wasn't just saying, God, I'm here, you know, and, and I'm waiting for your voice to hit me in the head before I do anything. No, he established a plan, and he worked the plan. There, here's the takeaway for us today. If you want to move forward in your faith, if you want to grow in your faith, and if you're feeling stuck, you need a plan. And then, and then you got to work your plan. Uh, the question I have for you is simple, but it's profound. What is your plan? Not, not what are you hoping is going to happen? Because we can do that all the time, right? You know, I could go, like, what's your dream? What's your vision? We, we, we'll spit out all kinds of vision statements and all kinds of hopes and dreams and all that stuff. No, no, like, what's your plan? What, what are you planning to do? Not the instant experience that you're trying to somehow maybe stumble into. It's the same question I would ask you if you say, so you say you want a new job. Somebody says, I want a new job. The first thing I'm going to ask is, what, what's your plan? So somebody says, well, I'm just praying about it. Well, here's the problem with that. Faith without works is dead. I can, I, there's nothing I can do about somebody that just says, I'm just praying and I'm hoping that somehow an employer is going to call me out of nowhere. No, what's your plan to get a better job? What's your plan to get out of debt? What's your plan to have a better marriage? What's your plan to have better children and better parenting? What's your plan? The question is, what steps are you taking towards deepening your walk with God? And are you regularly implementing that plan? Some, somebody might hear that and say, well, isn't it God's job to grow your faith? Absolutely. But you need a plan to engage with what God wants to do in your heart. You need a plan that puts you in position to hear and respond to what he wants you to do. I, the problem is if we're not working our plan, we're not in the right mindset often to even hear from God. You get them saying, it's like, God, I'm just waiting for you to hear my voice. But yet we're dwindling and our, and our relationship with, with him is becoming anemic. And then he's trying to speak, but we got so many other voices in our head, we can't hear them. We have to implement a plan to keep ourselves in the right position to be able to hear his voice. So again, what's your plan? Uh, can I share my plan with you? I, I I would ask you your plan, I, 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 but the problem is, or I'd, I'd try to share your plan. I don't know your plan, okay? Uh, the only person's plan I know is myself, and I'll, I'll give you mine today, and this is, this is, it's simple. But here's my plan for growing in faith and moving forward in my relationship with God, and it's got three parts, okay? Three things that I try to do consistently to position myself for spiritual breakthrough. Now, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more just like anything. It's more complex of the nuances of what things I try to do in my personal life. But these are the high points of the three-step plan of my life to try to make sure I'm positioned for spiritual breakthrough. Here's number one. Every day, I have to have my time for prayer and word and personal development. I have to start the day in prayer. It, I have to. I, it, it has to be. I have to shake off the things of yesterday. I have, if, if whatever it is that's trying to crowd me out from yesterday, that's trying to remind me of failures from yesterday, anything that was trying to weigh me down from yesterday, i got to shake that off first thing in the morning. Praying for a fresh new anointing for that day. Praying for my family. Praying for my church family. Praying for my city. Praying for wisdom. Every day I beg God for wisdom. Please, God, give me wisdom. And then I begin to thank him, or I even start with thanks, and letting him know all the things. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for a roof over my head. I'm thankful for a car that breaks down every now and then, but I still got a car. I'm thankful for the things of God. But I got to start the day that way. I have to have some time of word in the morning. I've got to do something that makes sure I have an intake and meditate on the living word of God on a daily basis. If I don't, I start to grow dry. 
I just know myself. It just happens. I need that. That's where you start to hear the same things you've been reading, you've heard for your whole life, but all of a sudden you're like, wow, I never knew that because it's a daily ingestion of the Word of God. There's very few days in my life that I'm not digesting a book or listening to a leadership or theology, theology podcast. That's just my thing. You, I mean, I'm just giving you my thing. This is what I have to do. If I don't have it in me, when you guys show up, when you guys say, hey, listen, Pastor Jason, I need some inspiration. I need some wisdom. And my team shows up. They sit in my office. They're saying, I need something today. Please, I'm, 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 feeling, I'm feeling like I need something in my life. If I don't have it in me, I don't have it to give to them. And what I'm doing my best to do is every day pour that stuff in. And if you call me at certain points in the early morning, you're just not going to get me. It's going to go, unless it's an emergency, call me four times in a row if you need me because that may let me know that it's a real emergency, all right? But if it's not, you're probably not going to get me because I'm doing this. Early in the morning, I'm ingesting this stuff. I'm making sure that I've got something in me when others need it from me. Number two, I sharpen my iron. The only way I can find, I've found to truly stay sharp is to allow other iron to keep me that way. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. And so I have a small group of men in my life that I open up to. I have a small group of men in my life that I'm able to share ideas with, my fears with. I'm able to share uh, of my family situations. I've got there, there, one of those is my pastor and my father. Okay, we, 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 the others are people that are on the same season of life that I am and others that are, that are older. I don't think I don't have anybody in that group that's younger than me or, or what, uh, you know, that, that's not in that same season of life. But I'm able to now express, they're able to express, I'm able to go through doctrine. I'm able to go through the, uh, the, the latest current events and sharpen myself and make sure that I'm not way off in left field somewhere. Some, I, I've given all these people permission, not all these, there's several of them, I've given them permission to say, hey, listen, this just seems off what you're saying right there. Hey, yeah, that, that, that's a little odd. Let's, let's work on that. Pastor, he doesn't just say it quite like that. He just lets me know it's off. You know, he doesn't. <laughs> he's just like, oh, you know, no, son. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's what I want. I beg for that. I need that. I want that in my life. That's the only reason I'm standing here today is because my iron has been sharpened by other people in my life that I've given permission to. Let's go to number three. Oh, let me tell you this, really. A little side note. Okay, some of you are like, well, you know, you, you're, you're keeping your iron sharp and accountability and all that stuff. Well, where's your wife and all that? Well, let me tell you something. My wife has full access to my life. We talk about everything, and we talk about it often. We talk on the phone. We talk, we talk all the time, okay? She certainly can step in and hold me accountable for, for things, but it is my goal. And she does, by the way. She absolutely does. But it is my goal to keep get enough emotional and spiritual accountability elsewhere so that I can focus on loving her and we can look, focus on loving each other and loving our son so my wife doesn't have to be my accountability partner as a whole. She doesn't have to babysit me day and night. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to try to get myself in good enough shape that my spouse doesn't have to do all that work. We can focus on loving each other. All right, this is just some, some, some things that I've learned in my life. Number three, here's the last and final thing of my steps here. And I'm at church unless I'm out of town or can't move. <laughs> okay, they're, they're, this is where I'm renewed. This is where healing takes place. This is where the word of God is preached. This is where the anointing flows. This is where I'm reminded that I'm a part of something that is much bigger and better than all of my problems. This is where I'm renewed. This is where my family's at. This is where we can learn to love each other. This is where we share. This is where we grow. This is where the Holy Ghost is poured out. I'm at the house of God unless I'm out of town or can't move. I've found that I need all three. And then I've also found that each one needs the other two. If, if, I, don't, if I just do one of these, it, it, it just doesn't work out. I have to be. It, being at the house of God helps me to be accountable in these other areas or keeps me fresh. The, the daily prayer keeps me to where I'm even open to having someone else talk to me or instruct me. So these kinds of things work together. And the number one key to the plan working for me personally is consistency. Everybody say consistency. 
I'd love to hear your plans. I'm confident a lot of y'all's plans are, are, are phenomenal and they're beautiful. I don't know them, so I shared mine today to give some inspiration for some of you that are looking for ways to find a better plan to work towards. So here's step one. Have a plan and work your plan. Pastor Jason, you're telling me that all I need is a plan to experience a guaranteed immediate spiritual breakthrough? Maybe. That's definitely possible. But it might depend on your attitude as well. Let's head back to Ephesus, okay? So Paul is in the synagogue and he's teaching. And Luke tells us that he does this for three months. And somewhere during this course of three months, something falls apart. The Bible says in Acts 19 and 9, some of them, the people Paul was ministering to, became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Some of them became obstinate. Here's the second step that you need to put in place to get unstuck in your relationship with God and move forward. Number two, don't be obstinate. Uh, that's a, that's a word that we don't use a whole lot anymore. It's a little bit of an old school word. You don't hear the kids saying obstinate too much, you know. But I'm going to give you a picture to show you the definition of what obstinate means. You guys ready for the definition of obstinate? Here we go. This is what obstinate is right here. Ready? There you go. That's obstinate. Have you ever been in a store and see someone's child having a full-on meltdown? Yeah, yeah. And it's a terrible thing because you know you shouldn't look, but it's really hard to look away. <laughs> You're just like, I don't want to see this. Or I'm trying not to look, but man, what is happening? <laughs> all right. And all we could think is, thank God it's not my kid. I saw one, one child and... Uh, you know, it was like a normal kid, you know, was doing their thing. And, and then all of a sudden, the mom told them they couldn't bring their ball in the store. And this child starts to have a full, like, obstinate breakdown, you know. And he gets on the floor, and he lays out with legs out like this and arms like this with his face dead on the floor in the middle of the store and just won't move. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. You know, and then she, the mom was like, stop, you're embarrassing me, stop. You know, and she's trying to get him. He's like, eh, eh. <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to move. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my Lord, help me. You know, and she did, it was kind of a big kid, so she was trying to pick him up, and he wouldn't be, you know, he wasn't having it. So I'm just like, man, this is tough. That's obstinance. When you see the word obstinate in the Bible, it often refers alongside another phrase or appears alongside other phrases that speak to this condition of our heart. See, the idea of obstinance and hard-heartedness comes together. A hard heart is a heart that is unwilling to hear. I preached it for just a few minutes. It's a heart that's not interested in correction. It describes a person that is actively trying to turn down the volume of the voice of God. To be hard-hearted is to start routinely telling God, no, I don't want to hear it, and I'm not going to do what you say to do. This is exactly what's happening in Ephesus in this Jewish synagogue that Paul is preaching in. Paul and the people there, they, they, they were once very interested in hearing what the apostle had to say, and no longer do they want to listen. They have chose not to believe. In fact, they're beginning to resist what God is doing among them. And can I be honest with you? This story should scare us. The people that have become obstinate, these are God's people. These are people that know scripture. These are people, the kind of people that show up to synagogue every weekend. They know all the songs. They can quote a lot of verses. They've been around this thing for a long time, and some of them their entire lives, and they are becoming hard-hearted. They're faithful, but hard-hearted. They're faithful, but hard-hearted. They're knowledgeable, but hard-hearted. Some of them have positions, but they're hard-hearted. Some of them have served God for years, but they're hard-hearted. Are you getting the scary part yet? What happened to them could potentially happen to any of us. People who have been around this thing for a long time who start saying, and they start thinking, no, I don't want to hear that anymore. I've decided I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I don't care what God has to say about it. So let's look at this verse again. And this, this time, I want to point out a different word that you might have missed the first time we went through it. Let's look at 
Acts 19 and 19. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly malign the way. They didn't start that way. There was a time where they were open. There was a time where they were hungry. There was a time when they wanted to learn. They accepted and even sought after counsel and instruction. They were curious and they were open. And then they weren't because their hearts became hardened. Their hearts became obstinate. Could it be that for somebody here today that this is possibly becoming true of you? Maybe at some point earlier in your life you were moving forward and you were growing and you were, you're, you're, because your heart was open and you were willing to listen, but that's not where you are today. There's a hardening taking place. This is a problem that I see often in saints over time, especially what I call career saints, people that have been in it. You know, it's the same as you would see on a job or somewhere else. And they're just there. And after a while, man, their heart's not in it. They're just like, listen, I got to stick in this thing for another few years because of retirement. I'm just in it now. I'm not, heart's not here. And I see that with saints after a while. And I see the way they talk about things. And I see the way they respond to sermons. And I see their comments about the sermon. And it wasn't about how it touched their heart and how it moved them. It was about some intellectual piece in there about I've never heard the scripture quite like that. Well done, sir. And I could appreciate some comments, and I can appreciate some of that stuff, but some, after a while, it starts to reveal what's happening inside is we're not letting it hit us in here. We're just letting it bounce off of some things that we already know up here. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment of honesty and vulnerability with you this morning, but I tell you, there's been times in my life, even recently, where I said, God, I, I, I've, I've got to change something in me because I... I begin to where I would listen to sermons and I would go to conferences and I would hear some messages and, I, and what immediately was coming to mind was, my goodness, that's a good message. I wonder how I could use that thought and be able to take a piece of that and preach it myself. Or I could use some of these pieces and say, my goodness, that was really good. Maybe that could help someone else. How could I help someone with this word? How can I use this to be able to, to, to gain more knowledge and be able to grow from that in that way as opposed to it piercing my heart and changing me on the inside? So I said, God, I want it to be when I hear your word, when the word is preached, that I'm letting it go right in there and I soak it in and I say, God, let me hear what you wanted me to hear out of this as opposed to what I wanted to be able to just analyze from it. Could it be to hear somebody today, this is true of you. And I maybe, maybe you're not aware of how far it's gone until you have talked about it today. You see, it's possible to be very hard-hearted and not even recognize it. I'll be honest with you. I say it's not possible. I say most of the time when someone's hard-hearted, they have no idea. And, and Pastor and I, we can, we, we can vouch for this. I mean, often... Someone sits in, the, sits in the couch or sits on the office and we're ready to share, we're ready to talk, and you can tell within seconds whether their heart is hard. Their heart is hard. You could tell within moments whether or not they're ready to receive. You could tell within moments whether or not they're saying, you know what, I, I see that there's something in here and I'm ready to change. Or that they come in there saying, I don't see what the problem is. You're sitting in church and the sermon is about forgiveness, and the preacher starts to reading a verse after verse about you needing to forgive other people that have hurt us. And in that moment, you hear the Spirit of God dealing with you about a grudge that you're holding against someone, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is asking you to forgive and to let it go and to give it to him. But maybe it's not the first time that he's spoken to you about this, but just like the last time, the minute the call for forgiveness echoes in your mind, then the anger and the resentment and the bitterness comes flooding in. And in your heart, you say, God, no, I won't let go. And in that moment when you say no, something in your heart hardens. Maybe you're reading the Bible and you see some scriptures and 
you, and the scripture starts to make it plain and then something that you're doing is not right in the eyes of God and, and maybe there's a relationship you're in, maybe it's a decision that you've made, maybe it's a habit that you're engaging in, maybe it's a desire that you're entertaining, whatever it is, you can clearly see through scripture that God wants you to stop it and change it and you clearly hear his voice in that moment saying, this isn't good for you and I'm asking you to honor my word and obey my commands but you really like that thing, whatever it is. And maybe it's been a part of your life for a long time and you don't want to see your life really without it. So in your heart, you say, no, God, I won't. And again, in that moment, your heart gets harder. Maybe you've been in a moment where you knew God was speaking to you, but it was through someone else, someone that's close to you, someone that's close to him. It's somebody that's in your small group, maybe a, maybe it's a family member. It could be a spouse. It could be a minister. It could be a counselor. It could be a pastor preaching to you in a sermon. Whoever it is, maybe they tell you some tough truth about yourself, something that you're doing wrong, something that you need to change, and you don't want to hear it. But at the same time, it rings true. And maybe instead of listening And taking it to heart, you get defensive. You say, you don't understand. You weren't there. You don't get it. You don't understand me. This is who I am. This is how I work. This is my life. And it's all just a fancy way of saying, no, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to hear what you're having to say, and I'm not going to do it God's way. And again, something in your heart hardens. I was talking to someone recently, and they're sharing with me some some tough situations that's happened in their life and some tragedy and just circumstances, and they're sharing and they're pouring out and they're needing answers and they're and here's here's where they are and 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 they're just really just opened up and I said, okay, and I felt it. It's a feeling that I'm very familiar with. Just uh, it doesn't happen very often, but but when it happens, I know it. God speaking to me. He had a boy, he had a word for him. And I began to speak this word that was a word that God had for them that was the answer for that situation. And I spoke the word. And their response was, no, it's too hard. That's too hard. You know, that's easy for you to say was what they came out of their mouth. And they said, if you were only in my shoes, you wouldn't say that. And I said, oh, If I was in your shoes, what I would want more than anything was for someone to say, Thus saith the Lord. What I would need was somebody to come and speak the truth to me. What I would need is somebody to tell me maybe what I didn't want to hear, but what I needed to hear, and it was the word from God. All of these no's, they will bring us to a place that we become obstinate to the voice of God. And again, the scary thing is it can happen to any of us. So what do you do? How do you protect yourself from that? Well, the answer to that question is extremely simple, but it's also very difficult. It's simple. It's simply to go to God and say yes. Yes, you're right about what you said. Yes, I've been stubborn and I've been angry and I've been defensive. Yes, I need to turn around in this area. Yes, I need to go and I need to listen to, I need to finally start to listen and I need to get your help and I'm ready to do some changes in my life. And so here's the good news for you guys today. While it takes a lot of no's to create a hard heart, just one heart felt Yes can completely change your spiritual condition. While it takes a while to drift into a place of obstinance, it just takes a few moments of sincere, genuine prayer and repentance to get back to a place of sensitivity and obedience. I want to close today by giving somebody a chance to say yes. Maybe... For you, the issue isn't hard-heartedness. 
Maybe you want to say, yes, God, I, I'm committing to a plan and I'm, faith, I'm going to faithfully put it into action. Maybe you want to say, yes, God, I, I understand that breakthrough is a process and I'm committing to stay in that process so that you can do what only you can do in your life, my life. Maybe there's some ladies in this room that had a powerful breakthrough moment here on Friday and Saturday, but you know that what got started there needs to continue in the weeks and months to come. And you want to say, yes, God, I hear what you're going to say, and I, and I see what you're doing, and I'm asking you to have your way in my life and in my home and in my family. Maybe there's somebody here today that just feels stuck, and you desperately want to move forward. Maybe you're feeling stuck in your relationship with God. Maybe you're feeling stuck in unforgiveness. Maybe you're feeling stuck in a habit or addiction. Or maybe you're feeling stuck mentally or emotionally or whatever it is. There's an altar where you can begin the process of getting unstuck and then start that today. What area of your life do you need to tell God yes in? Don't put this on your neighbor right now. This is for you. What area of your life do you say, God, I need to say yes? I'm asking for anyone that feels God speaking to you through this message in just a few moments to come up in prayer and give him your, let him give you direction. Let him give you encouragement. Let him give you hope and let him give you peace. Would you stand? I'm asking you to raise your hands across this place and let God begin to speak to you and let God begin to deal with you about hope and let God begin to deal with you about peace that if you will surrender it to him that things will begin to change. Things will begin to happen in your life that you haven't seen happen before because you are ready for a fi to finally say yes. You're ready for a transformation in your life. You're ready for a renewal in your life. If you'd start making your way to this altar and you're saying, God, I've said no for long enough. I've said no for long enough and I'm ready. I'm ready for transformation. I'm ready for a breakthrough. I'm ready, God, I'm ready because I don't want my heart to be hardened. I don't want my heart to be hardened. I don't want my life to be, to be moving towards carnality. I don't want it to be moving towards just my intellect. I, I want it in my heart. I want change. I want transformation and I want breakthrough today. God, do your will. Do your work. Have your way in me. Have your way in me.